Imagine going to the bank to borrow thousands of shillings to invest in a business that promises mouth-watering financial returns only to return later to realize that the promise was only meant to lure you into investing. Conned by Peter Wangai's famous Greenscape Greenhouses Limited. Too much ambition breaks a man, but too little takes him nowhere. That is a famous quote by John Luganda in his play, The Burdens. This is the dilemma that our main character in this episode finds himself in. Does he relax and let fate dictate his life, or does he take matters into his own hands? Is it a case of too much ambition or was it a premeditated financial scam? This is the story of John Moridi Wangai, a man whose enterprise went down with billions of investors' money. It's also the story of a boy who traces his roots back to the county of Nyandarwa. Nyandarwa is one of the food baskets of Kenya, a production powerhouse for potatoes, cabbage, carrots, peas, milk and other vegetables. However, due to its poor state of infrastructure, especially the roads, 46% of its residents live below the poverty line. This was the situation that Peter Moridi Wangai would find himself in while growing up. As a little boy, he would spend a lot of time in his parents' farm. There was a bumper harvest after a bumper harvest of potatoes and cabbage every season. Peter observed how poorly his father would be paid for a sack of potato that was often overstocked. The problem, he heard his father say, was the brokers. He observed how the cabbages would also rot in the chamber during the rainy season, which in Nyandaro was almost throughout the air, as the roads would be impossible by the buyers. But with all the hardship that the village life brought, Peter managed to pursue an education, hoping to make a better life from agriculture for him and for those around him. He attended Losogoa Primary School in Nyahururu area. Since his family was poor, he was sponsored by well wishes. He then studied tours and travel at college. Employment was hard to come by. Life was as hard as nails. But Peter couldn't fathom returning home back to the waterlogged plateau beyond the Abadeas. He was willing to take anything that came by. He was God-fearing. His mother had raised him as a staunch Christian. But here in town, he had learned to lie without feeling guilty. He had to survive. For the next two years, 2004 through 2006, he set up a tree hawking business on the roadside in the outskirts of Nyahururu town. He pounded soil mixed with cow dung remains into black polythene porches, planted tree and flower seedlings into them, watered them daily and fended off wandering stray cows and sheep. He'd eventually sell a piece or two in a day, getting enough money for a meal. But he was tired on living for his tummy only. He dreamt of owning things, cars, homes, land. Between 2006 and 2010, Peter would try expanding his tree seedlings business, hopping from one idea to the other, each feeling more spectacularly than the other. But his fortunes would change when a friend introduced him to the concept of brokering land and architectural landscaping. Just get me a buyer, his friend had said. Whatever he pays beyond the asking price will be yours to keep. At around the same time, he also discovered that one could advertise his business on Facebook. And so he embarked on a journey of self-improvement, learning how to use Facebook, creating pages and groups, paying for adverts, and responding to inquiries. Peter also started improving his English, thinking fast in his mother tongue and quickly translating it into English, speaking slowly so that he can hear his thoughts and consciously carrying his tongue around so that his R's and L's were profound. But he's still trying. 
My name is Peter Morgan Ray. Meanwhile, across the country, men and women sold their garments in toil, some in blue, others in white collar jobs. But to all, it's the brown paper that mattered. 2003, somewhere in Nakuru Shabab, Jane, not her real name, was preparing to start a new job as an admin officer in a small manufacturing company. She was optimistic of the future, especially now that she had moved away from her toxic husband to start life with her eight-year-old son, Adam. Jane was not earning much, but it was enough for her rent, her son's school fees, and her household's maintenance. Every month, she sacrificed a lot of her vices and pleasures in order to save towards her son's high school fees. Somewhere in Waitadi, Deka, around 2014, George and his friends had just finished registering the self-help group, or commonly referred to as Chama. George is a master in carpentry and joinery, but a struggling fundi. So, together with his friends, they decided to take their economic matters into their own hands. The plan was to pull funds together, buy workshop equipment and machinery, and open up the biggest wood workshop in Dika Town. George and his friends started with a simple saving plan to save just a hundred shillings every day, and they would meet every Sunday to reconcile their accounts. Meanwhile, somewhere in Ntulele, Narok, Jacob, a seasoned wheat farmer, was getting ready for another long day on the farm. He owned an expensive 64-acre farm that he had inherited and part that he had leased. He was known around the village as he was also a dairy farmer. He had made a lot of money farming, I mean, over time. Not all seasons were the same though. Sometimes the harvest was bumper, but the market prices were low. Sometimes the rains came late. Sometimes wealth would affect the whole crop, but he persisted and eventually had enough saved to absorb shocks in case of bad season. 4 to 2015 Peter Moridi Wangai had managed to sell some land and had gotten a good commission. He had saved up and was looking to embark on agriculture. He went back to his rural home. He poured almost all of his savings on potatoes and cabbage for a season. And just like his father before him, he did not make as much money as he had expected. Wiser from that experience, Peter decided to change the way he farmed. He wanted a way that he could control the outcome despite the weather. He wanted maximum output on crops. He was hungry to succeed. That is when the idea of greenhouses hit him. Low on funds though, he approached the friend who had introduced him to the business of selling land to see if he could get a loan. He had an elaborate plan on where to source a greenhouse, how to manage the crop and cut costs associated with too much cold and drought. He needed a capital injection of 200,000 with which to build a greenhouse, pipe the waterways, buy the seeds and necessary inputs to sustain tomato crops. In his estimation, he would make about 250000 in six months. After deducting the operating expenses, the venture would not make a profit. He would therefore need to reinvest and hope to break even after near. Then he would start paying back the capital plus interest, a friendly rate of 15% per annum. He hoped his friend would buy his plan as it was realistic. No. You will just be turning up my capital. The friend had refused. No one will let you stay with their money that long. Dejected, Peter approached his local bank. But since he did not have collateral, the bank rejected his application too. It was George Clarkson who said in his book, The Richest Man in Babylon, if a man has within him the soul of a free man, will he not become respected and honored in his own city in spite of his misfortune? And it was that fire within Peter that propelled him to overlook his current obstacle. He knew he'd get a breakthrough, and he wanted it now. He approached another businessman, 
one that was a risk taker, one that was expecting high returns. It was here that he changed his presentation. Instead of 200,000, he asked for 500,000 with a promise to pay back 20,000 shillings every month for the next three years. He had just promised a 44% return on investment to the businessman. Peter did not see the risk in it at all. He knew he would make the greenhouse project work and make money while at it. So he secured his first ever backing and off he went to work. He did not even have a registered business name, so the money was deposited in his personal bank account. He then started coming up with the concept of a business name. Having read countless motivational books and Bible verses, he had always felt the urge to identify himself with God. He felt that he was the golden age dreamer, and all his concept had to be birthed under the banner. From tree nurseries to selling land, landscaping and now greenhouses, he felt the best name to identify his enterprise with would be Goldenscape. In no time, his first greenhouse was up and running. The crop was doing well, the market was ready, and money was assured. Every month, he used part of the initial capital he had not invested to pay off his loan. He was happy, and the investor was happy. I have a friend who wants you to invest his money. Are you able to do the same terms as mine? That text message from the investor changed the course of Golden Scape for the next five years. The boom of greenhouses. Now, accounting or bookkeeping is one skill that most people who hustle tend to undermine. They say, as long as I can count my money, I don't need any classes. That is the kind of knowledge that the Bible talks about in Proverbs 24, verse 3. It says, By wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. It is the lack of such knowledge, therefore, that according to statistics, causes 80% of all startups to fail. The basic business model dictates that capital is used to acquire income generating assets which in return generate income. The generated income covers first the production cost, also known as the cost of sales, which includes the stock, the inputs, the raw materials, etc. Then the remaining income covers all operational costs such as salaries, wages, fuel, repairs, maintenance, marketing, etc. Then what is left is subjected to corporate taxes. Then from the remaining income an amount is set aside for reinvestment, also known as retained earnings. It is only then that the providers of capital or investors can be repaid. This amount to investors is known as return on capital or as in corporate dividends. This ensures the continuity of the business and guards against unrealistic expectations by the providers of capital. This is a required and expected accounting practice and any auditor who certifies anything that does not follow the international accounting standards is not worth his name. Peter Moridi ignores the above laid concept, but none of his initial investors could tell either. Unfortunately, I was not able to ascertain whether there were financial statements at the end of each financial year, and if so, who audited them. He operated with 100% backing by investors, with a promise and 72% annual return. 72% At Greenscape, an investment of 320000 for one of their greenhouses and 550,000 shillings paid in two installments at the end of six months each of 275000 This was the hooker and sinker that attracted hundreds of investors. I use the word investors here with a pinch of salt. 
albeit with some seasoning too, as it is a glorified way of referring to gamblers, though unintentional. These were gamblers. Facebook ads led to many more inquiries, but referrals were the main source of business. Peter Moridi, through his Golden Scape company, was now receiving millions of shillings every month. There was a robust expansion plan of greenhouses in areas where land was cheap, from Ruti and Lycabia. The once shy boy with an acne face and short scruffy hair had started to glow. Pricey dermatological ointments and hair oil had rejuvenated his youth. His once frail frame was now taut, and his refined English suited his now important role, or roles considering he referred to himself as the founding chairman, the CEO, and also the managing director. He sat in a big office, and although he was supposed to be a professional financial advisor and agr agronomist, his office portrayed his boyish world fantasy. It looked like a washroom with a dining room and a bathroom in it. Potted artificial plants dotted the corners. For an agricultural enthusiast, one would expect at least live exotic plant. The walls were bright gold and blue, with his huge portrait seemingly seeking attention. He had a TV stand too, and a cabinet, perhaps for utensils. A large chandelier hung above his desk. Not that it was necessary. But he felt the need to show the opulence that comes with money. Girls were also starting to notice him, especially now that he owned a big car and a very fat bank account. What followed in the next two years, 2017 through 2018, was a remarkable expansion fueled by the strategic plan to market through social media, TV, and radio. Every six months, the investors receiving their returns would do so in a ceremony. A five-star treat at an upmarket hotel in the full view of a paid media house. This news was then broadcast in the 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. business news. The investors were asked to bring their family and friends to be guests at these momentous occasions. The recipients were first given large dummy checks and asked to smile for the camera as the participants clapped in the background. Their pictures were then splashed on all social media pages with the caption, We pay, no stories. More investors pledged their cash. Peter Moridi bank accounts were now busting their sims. There was a Facebook page splashing the images, a YouTube channel with a hired TV presenter to push the agenda, and periodic media tours to validate the idea. There was no bold to advise him, no watchdog to curtail his indulgence, and no regulator to protect the investors.